I tell you what, God is so good, good, good to us in our lives. And whether you realize it or not, this is a new and glorious day. Not just today. It's a new and glorious season that God is leading his people. And guess what? All of us get to be a part of that. I tell you, what God is moving and what God is doing is not just happening here. It's not just happening, you know, it's happening all over the place. Where sons and daughters of the king are rising up and saying, you know what? God's doing a new thing and we're going to walk in it. God's leading us in a direction and we're going to walk in it. And the reality is that part, a big piece of that is our identity and those things that we, who he says we are. And we've been in this series, I think this is week six, talking about our, the things that seek to steal the identity, who God says we are, you know, so that we can be free. See, the enemy doesn't want you being free. Oh, if you're saved and you're on your way to heaven, he can't do anything about that. But the last thing he wants is you walking in the fullness of who you're being created to be. Because when you and I begin to walk in who God, Jesus has created us to be, when we begin as the body of Christ to walk in who he's called and created us to be, Satan can't do thing one about it. See, it's like walking, opening a big old can of whoop butt on him, and he can't stop it. I'm so tired of hearing the church say, well, you know, the devil's just... That's not even in the book. The devil has no authority except that which we give him. And so the reality is we have, God said, I'm doing these things and the enemy wants to steal them away. He can't create anything himself. He can only either counterfeit, pervert, or steal what God wants to give us. Amen? That's all he can do. He has no power other than that. All right? And so we've been talking about this. Last week we talked about how, you know, when we don't fully understand and walk in who we are on this side of the cross. Amen? I tell you what, there's a whole lot of people who love Jesus with all their heart that haven't quite moved from the Old Testament to the New Testament yet. From the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And when we don't fully step into the new, it's like what God has desired to give us is stolen away. But I want you to know this morning, I, I want to look at yet another, a similar way in which the enemy keeps us from what God wants us to do. And we find it in another story in Jesus' life. You know, what's interesting is you start dissecting the last week of Jesus' life, how many incredible things there are. And so Jesus, now remember, you know, hey, Easter is just 43 days away. If you, have, if you kind of not realize that, it's just 43 days away. It's coming up quick. It'll be here before we know it. And Jesus, in Luke chapter 19, Jesus is finishing up his final journey to Jerusalem, and he's come to Bethany. Now, go ahead and put that map up there, Brian. Most of us, including myself, I've not been to Israel. I've not walked the path, so I don't know how that works. But the reality is, you look at that map, as they were coming up from Jericho, they came to Bethany. Now, Bethany is about a mile and a half from Jerusalem. Now, it's not like Gaston. In Gaston, what happens? It's all flat. <laughs> Man, baby, you can see the church from 600. That's a mile and three quarters. You can see it. You can see the steeple hanging out there, right? That's not how it was. We're, we're talking this. Some of you are all from the hills in the south. You know how, what we're talking about. And so Jesus, as he comes to Bethany, what's happening, he can't see the city. He's a mile and a half away. But they're still climbing Mount the Mount of Olives. And they come to Bethany, and it's there in Bethany that Jesus tells two of his disciples, hey, go over there, there's a colt tied over here on such and such a street, go get it and bring it here, I'm going to ride it. And so they go and do exactly like Jesus says, and he gets on the colt and begins to ride from Bethany, the Bethphanage, and then on making their way all the way in. And verse, <clears throat> Luke chapter 19, verse 36 says this, now as he was going, they were spreading their cloaks on the road. Now, we're talking about the triumphal entry here. We're talking about Palm Sunday. We have to realize it started in Bethany. See, we got this idea somewhere because of flannel graph and, and children's stories, right? You know, somehow Jesus and the, and was riding into the gates of Jerusalem and all of a sudden all these people along in the crowd were like, hey, hey, let's get some palms and do this. That's not how it is. That's not what the scripture says. 
Scripture says it started in Bethany. They couldn't even see Jerusalem yet. And yet, when Jesus got on the colt and began his way, his disciples took off their coats and started laying them on the ground as they prepared to go. Verse 37 says, And as soon as he was approaching near the descent of Mount of Olives, so they're still going up the mountain, all right? They're still coming upwards. And the whole crowd of disciples began praising God at joyfully with a loud voice, and the miracles which he had seen, for the, all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, understand a couple things. When we, they were traveling, they were coming up, and there was a whole crowd of disciples. Now, watch that now. Who was it? It was the disciples of Jesus, those who had been following Jesus, been with Jesus. It wasn't just some random people in the crowd. The people who were traveling with Jesus began to lay their coats, and as he went from Beth Bethany to Bethany, and then he began to make the final descent up on the top of Mount Olives, they were shouting and carrying on. It was his disciples cutting palm branches and waving them, you know, celebrating that Jesus was coming, that the King was coming. See, the party started, if you will, out of sight of Jerusalem. Now, the second thing we need to understand is when you get to the top of Mount of Olives, that, that next picture, they came from Jericho. It's 3,300 feet elevation transformation in 15 miles. Any mountain climbers in the room? Ever tried to climb a mountain? 3,300 feet is a long way, going up in 15 miles. And it's not just like this, it's like this. On the way up, and the top of Mount Olives is like 2,600 feet. And then you go down into the Kidron Valley and then back up into Jerusalem. So you got to understand, when Jesus comes to the descent, to the top of the Mount of Olives, he's looking over the city. Wanda, down, down in Tennessee, right? When you come to the top of the hill and you look down in the valley, what do you see? You see towns, right? If the town's setting down the valley, you come up and you can see the whole town. That's what, Je what happened to Jesus. He's just not seeing the wall. He's just not like driving up to Gaston, you know, seeing the town. No, he's up above looking down on the city. And verse 41 says this, And when he approached Jerusalem, as he makes the descent, he comes over the top, he saw the city and wept over it. Now I want you to know, when it says that Jesus wept, it was not like a little tear in the corner of his eyes. It's not like the Indian commercial it used to be on when they saw all the trash and there was a little tear in the corner of his eyes. No, no, that's not what that word means. He wasn't a little bit disturbed or upset. That word wept means to mourn. It means to lament. To express uncontainable grief. That means grief that you can't keep inside. Some of you know what we're, I'm talking about there. The grief in you could not be contained in you and it started to spill out of you. That's what's happening to Jesus. As he says, he's, he weeps. And so here's Jesus sitting on the colt looking down on Jerusalem in the midst. Now watch this. Now you've got to get this. It's in the midst of the celebration. People are shouting and praising him and waving the palm branches and putting their coats on the ground. And, and man, it's a major party. And as Jesus is coming down, he's weeping over the city of Jerusalem. Why? Look what it says in verse 42. He says, if you had known. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the city. Jerusalem. If you had known on this day, even you, the conditions for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. You say, what's Jesus talking about? As Jesus looked down on the city, on the temple, on the nation of people, he began to reflect upon not what he was going to endure. This had nothing to do with what he was going to face. He began to reflect on why he had come. What did he come to do? What was available to God's people? And they missed it. You know, why did Jesus come? Well, we talk about that all the time, right? Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came to restore that which was lost in the garden. God, Jesus came to restore you and I that we might fulfill the original commission God had to fill the whole earth with his glory. To take the Garden of Eden and fill the whole earth. Multiply, fill the whole earth, take dominion. Jesus came to restore what was lost. 
And as Jesus begins to descend in the city, he weeps and he grieves, he wails over what could have been, over what they missed out on. Jesus said, if you had known. Now that's an interesting statement because they should have known. It's no secret that Jesus was coming. 4,000 years of human history, you know, how many pages are in your Old Testament? Over and over, God says, hey, one day, the prophets say one day, there's gonna, I'm going to send one who's going to come, and he's going to do all these things, and he's going to set things right, and he's going to restore things, and he's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the one we're looking for. Over and over, and Jesus then shows up at just the right time, and he's not shy. We talk about it all the time on Thursday night. We look at Scripture, and Jesus is screaming. Not saying, but screaming indirectly, I'm Messiah. I'm the one. I'm the one who's come. I'm the one who God sent. I'm the one that He desires for you to have. Everyone knew He was Messiah. The disciples knew it. The people knew it. The religious leaders knew it. They knew all the prophecy and the promises, and yet they missed it. Why? Wait a minute. Why did they miss it? It seems so obvious, right? Has that ever happened in your life? It is just so stinking obvious, and, the, and I like to say the clue phone was ringing, and you're like, ah, I didn't hear that. What, what's that noise? It was like, somebody answered the clue phone, right? It's right there in front of you, but we miss it. And Jesus is weeping over the people. But why did they miss it? How did they miss it? Here's the key. They took what God was doing and tried to fit it into something they already knew. Watch this now. Jesus shows up, and he's doing something they've not seen before or experienced before, and they tried to take him and put him into the form that they know and are comfortable with. And guess what? Jesus didn't fit. Jesus didn't fit what they wanted him to do. And everybody, it happened to everybody. The disciples were doing it on the way to Jerusalem. What were they doing? Jesus got on the colt, and what are they doing? They're all excited. They're celebrating. Well, praise the king. Why? Because they believed Jesus was about to enter into the city. He was going to go in. He was going to overthrow the Romans. He was going to take David's throne, and he was going to set them free and reestablish David's throne over all of Israel. And not what he came to do, but listen, they were trying to take Jesus and put him in that form. Here's what he's going to do. Here's why he's come. Religious leaders did the same thing. They encountered Jesus, they heard Jesus, but they're like, you're a blasphemer. You don't fit into our mold and the things that we believe, and this is how it needs to be. And what happened? As a result, they missed, they missed it. It's not, it's not an unknown scenario for God's people either. Come on, how many times in the Bible do we see that happen? Come on, right? What happens? The Israelites, come on, we, we, we jump all over them all the time, right? Here they are. In slavery, God comes and shows up, sends Moses. They do 10 plagues. God does 10 plagues, right? Pharaoh says, get out of my country. Get out of here. They took the whole wealth of Egypt with them. They go out. God parts the Red Sea. They go out into the wilderness. Go to Mount Sinai. The glory of God comes down. You know, they see God. You know, he gives them the law. Along the way, he gives them water out of a rock and, and manna on the ground every morning. He takes them to the promised land. He says, now, hey, I'm ready. The promise I made to Abraham all those years ago. Come on, man, baby, we're, we're getting it now. We're going to send the 12 spies in, and what happens? Ten of them come back with a bad report, and the people are like, well, we can't do it. Now, wait a minute. God just did all of this. And we're like, well, you know, the way you have to take a land is you have to have a mighty army, and we don't have a mighty army, and we can't defeat them, and so we're not going to go. And what happens? God's like, okay. I believe God wept, wept over his chosen people rejecting all that he desired to give them. And he said, you're going to have to all die in the wilderness. God was not happy about that. Some people are like, well, yeah, this God, what they deserve, God, just whacking them. No, that wasn't God's heart. And he was broken because of their decision. 
They tried to take what God was doing and fit it into their box, into their point of view. Same thing happened in, with the people of Israel after Joshua died. You remember what happened? You know, Israel did all right as long as the elders were alive that were with Joshua, but as soon as they died, they got all sideways in the track. And God said, that's okay, you know, I'll, I'll fix this. He raised up judges. You know, go to Doug's, you know, Sunday school class. They're, they're in the book of Judges. Raises up 13 judges over and over and over again, raising them up, saying, I'm, I will lead you, I'll do this. And then we get to the book of 1 Samuel. And what happens? The people are like, God's like, I'm going to be your king. And they're like, no, no, we want a king like they have. We want a king like the rest of the world has. God's like, I got a great plan for you. He's like, no, the rest of the world does it this way. God, can't you fit in this? And God relents and gives it to them, right? Why? Why? They tried to take what God wanted to do and put it into their framework. Back in the text, verse 42, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. There comes a point where there's virtual blindness, where I try to take certain things and put them into what I know and I can't see this over here because this is all I can see and it's as if I'm blind. I can't see it all. It's been hidden from me. And I want to suggest this morning that when it comes to our identity in Christ, as God is revealing his plans and what he desires for our lives and who he says we are and the direction he's leading and the moves of the Holy Spirit for our lives and our families, our, 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 this local family of believers, our community, guess what? The temptation is to try and take what God is doing and fit it into something we've already known. We got grandkids now, so we have to have new toys. Amen? Come on. And so, you guys, ever, you guys remember this? Man, this is a powerful toy that has stood the test of time. Amen? Right? Why? Because what happens is we look at this and we're like, Young kids need to learn how to take what's in their hand, what they've been given, and determine where it fits, right? And so we, we give them a, a square block, and we're like, hey, that's pretty cool. And it's like, oh, it's blue, and it matches the blue on here. And we're like, okay, it's blue, it goes in the blue, and there's a square, and we put it in there. And we're like, yeah, we know how to do the square, right? We're, we're familiar with the square. We understand the square. But here's what happens. Then God gives us something that doesn't look like a square. Right? He's doing something new. He's moving. He's expanding. He's doing these things. And we get something that looks like this. We're like, it's blue. It must be a square. And so what do we do? We try and take it, and we try to get it into the square hole. And it doesn't fit. And then what do we do? We beat on it. Okay, amen. First we beat on it some more, right? It's got to fit. Somehow it's going to fit. And then we try to trim it up to fit the hole. <laughs> right? That's what we do in our lives. It's like, God, I know what you want to do, man. I see, I, I got this thing. It's going to fit in that hole. But then what? We, be, we come to our senses and we're like, oh, wait a minute. It fits in this other hole. Wait a minute. There, this is what God's doing. And it fits into that which he's created for it. But then, God does something else. And this time it's not blue. This time it's red and it's not square. And it looks like this. We're like, uh, 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 it won't fit in the square hole. It won't fit in the other hole we used that, that last time. Now what? Well, wait a minute. We have to begin to let the Lord reveal what he's doing and what that looks like and how it fits now. That's... What needs to happen, the reality is we attempt to take what God is doing, what he's put in our hand, and fit it into the form we already know. God starts to move, and we're like, well, we know what he's up to because he did that before. Right? And I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about our lives. Right? Oh, Lord, this is what you've been doing for the last 10 years. And now all of a sudden, Lord, starts stirring something. And like, well, God, I know you're doing this new thing over here, but how in the world? Come on, uh, Lynn's looking at me. How in the world can I take that and fit it into this thing I already have and already know? I want to suggest to you that when we do that, there is a danger that we'll miss out on what God has for us because we spend all our focus trying to get it into what we've known. And we become blinded to what he really wants to do. 
Why? Because it's familiar. It's familiar in our lives. Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 5, verse 33. And they said to him, the religious leaders, come on, you know, they're always after Jesus. The disciples of John are often fasting and offer, offer prayers, and the disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. Now here's the picture, right? Disciples in that day, here's what they do. The disciples of John, the Baptist, the disciples of the Pharisees, all these other disciples, one, they do these things, and one of the things they do is fast and pray on a regular basis. Let me give you the translation. All the people all do it this way. Jesus, how come you're not doing it that way? Isn't that what they were saying? And I want you to notice what Jesus says. He says, and he said to them, you cannot make the attendant of the groom fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the days will come when the groom is taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. Now Jesus gives them an interesting picture here. He says, who of you would ask the attendants of the groom? Now, he's talking wedding talk here, right? In Israel, the wedding was seven days long. Come on, yeah, yeah every year we got like, whoa, man, that's a lot of wedding. Yeah, you know what happens? You know, there would be a whole set of things, and the final day would be the final thing, and there would be food and all kinds of partying and all kinds of stuff going on all week. And Jesus says, oh, so would it be right to tell the attendants of the groom, you know what, you need to fast and pray. I know we're having a celebration. Man, it's Christmas, baby. But you need to fast and pray not, and, and, and seek the Lord. And Jesus is like, you can't do that. Why? Because you have to understand what's happening. And Jesus said, the thing I'm doing right now, it's new. It's different. It's not what it used to be, and it doesn't fit that. There's nothing wrong with fasting. There's nothing wrong with praying. In fact, there's a season for that. But right now, this is what I'm doing, and we have to embrace what I'm doing now, not what I have done or others say we should have done. Come on now. He says, you can't do that. But we fall in that trap, don't we? The old familiar story is there's a newlywed, and it's her first time to cook Christmas dinner. And she's preparing the ham, and mom's standing there with her and says what? Well, honey, you need to cut the ends off the ham and put it in, before you put it in the bowl. And she says, Mom, why? Why do I have to put the ham, cut the ends of the ham off before I put it in the pan? Well, that's because my mom did it that way. Well, they're preparing Christmas dinner, so Grandma's in the other room. So the young woman goes in, she says, Grandma, Grandma, how come you cut the ends off the ham before you put it in the pan? She said, well, that's the way, because that's the way my mom did it. And so, you know, great-grandma's not there. She, you know, and so the next day, the, this young bride goes over to great-grandma and says, great-grandma, i got to know why it's so important that we cut off the ends of the ham before we put it in the pan. She said, because my pan was too short. <laughs> come on now. That's the picture, Right? It's been done this way. We don't even know why it was done this way. But now what God's doing has to fit into that. And God's like, let me put it in something that will hold what I want to do today. In this season. In this epic time in life. And Jesus goes on, verse 34, and says, and he also tells them a parable. So now Jesus is like, let me give you a story. He says, no one. Say no one. I mean zero. Absolutely nobody will do this. All right? Tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will tear the new and the patch from the new garment will not match the old. Now, what's Jesus talking about? He said, he's talking about something about everybody knows. And let me tell you, in our culture, we're losing it. We don't understand what Jesus is talking about, right? As she's shaking her head, right? Because I, I know it's weird, but back in the day... When you got a hole in your jeans, you didn't celebrate. <laughs> Woo, got a hole, got a, baby, I'm going to wear them now. We didn't buy them that way. If you got a hole in your jeans, guess what? Mom patched it, or Grandma patched it, right? And I'm not, Steve said the other night, well, get one of them iron. I'm not talking the iron on kind. I'm talking about in the old days, right? I would get a hole in my jeans, and there was no way Mom was throwing them away. We can't afford new jeans. What are we going to do? We're going to patch them. So she would get a patch of a material and put it over the hole and stitch all the way around. It zigzagged it most of the time. It was ugly. 
Zigzag around. She didn't care. We're just patching jeans, right? I don't care if you got to wear them to school. You're going to wear them anyway. Now, Jesus says, what kind of patch are you going to put on there? See, the temptation is, well, I'm just going to get a piece of new denim and I'm going to cut out a patch and I'm going to sew it onto the hole. It'll be a little different than the color than those faded old jeans. But I'll put a new patch on it. Well, if anybody ever did that, what happens? Barb? Doesn't work. That's exactly right. What happens? That old pair of jeans has been washed dozens of times. The way you like them, and they're all soft, and the, the, the material's already shrunk, and you take that new piece of cloth and you sew it tightly over that. The first time you wash it, that denim shrinks of the patch. And when it shrinks, the rest of it doesn't shrink, right? Because it doesn't need to shrink. It pulls on those jeans and it rips them because the power of the shrinking of that and it ruins both the patch and the jeans or else you got to get a really big patch then and Jesus says nobody will do that no one takes something a piece of new cloth and puts it on an old garment you say well okay I, I get that but then Jesus says let me hit you with a second one verse 37 and it says then no one say no one Jesus said nobody's going to do this everybody knows better right that's what he's saying. And everybody knows better that you don't pour new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the wines and the skins will be ruined. Jesus begins to tell a story about every, something everybody knows. Now, how many winemakers we got in the house? See, most of you aren't going to admit that even if you were, right? How do you make wine? Well, you get a bunch of grapes, right? And back in the day, you stomped on them, right? And, and you juice them, right? And there's some pulp. And what happens? You put a little what? You put a little yeast in with it, and then you put it in a container and let it ferment. Now, who knows what happens in the fermentation process, chemi chemical people here, chemistry people? What? <laughs> Ever? You got that, man? Nope, you haven't got, <laughs> you haven't got that part yet, right? What happens? It expands. Why? Because the fermentation process gives off a gas. And that gas has got to go somewhere, right? And so what happens when you release that gas, there has to be enough stretch in order to keep that. Otherwise, it will bust. So Jesus says, hey, nobody will take an old wineskin and put new wine in it. Now, why? Well, think about it. Wine skins were leather containers. Now, we see these little leather fast flasks and we think that's what it is. On the front of your bulletin, that's not what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. They would take a or a goat and they would take the, lead, the hide from that and tie all the pieces ends together and they would put the wine in there, set it on a pole like that. Where's it at? Out in the sun where it would warm up and what happens so that it would ferment. Now, Think about that. If I put that in an old wineskin that cannot stretch, what's going to happen? You ever had anything explode? Example today, Janet's pipes went boop. Why? Because the ice expanded inside the pump. Ice has greater density than water. And what happens? The pipe gave way. If you put it in an old wineskin, it's going to blow it up. Now, that looks, that, that's not like two glasses of wine. We're talking about a whole batch there. Amen? And they're like, nobody does that. Nobody. Why? What do they do? They, they put new wine into what? A new wineskin. Verse 38, but the new wine must be put into a fresh wineskin. Now, when most of us hear that, we hear new. Why? Because most of our Bibles say new. In fact, I, I have some examples. The King James says this, but new wine must be put into new bottles, talking about new wineskins. New King James says it must be put into new wineskins. The New Ameri International Version says new wineskins. The New Living Translation says new wineskins. The perceived truth is that new wine has to go in a new wineskin. But here's the deal. When we think about new, we're thinking about something that's brand new. And it's an unfortunate translation, because look at the verse, verse 37 again. 
No one who pours new wine into an old wine skin, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. Now, the Greek words there are important. The word no, new, we, we understand that, right? Neos, young, unused, novel, brand new. Old means old, ancient, worn out. We get those two. But this other word means something, to, it doesn't mean new. It means this. It means new in quality, fresh in development or property, recently made fresh, not found like before. So here's the question. How do you make an old wineskin fresh again? So here's the question. How many of you have ever had a pair of good leather gloves? Man, there's nothing I like more than a good pair of leather gloves, right? But what happens if you're out working, and especially if it's getting winter and it's wet, you're, you're, you're stacking wood, and you got your good leather gloves on, and the wood's got water on it, or it's got snow on it, and you work and work, and what happens, Everett? What happens to your gloves, man? They get all wet, right? That's just a natural byproduct of doing the work, right? But what happens to those leather gloves once they get soaked? Okay, they, and they dry. You ever put on a pair of gloves that got, leather gloves got really wet? And you tell, Corey's <laughs> laughing, right? And you go to put them on, they are stiff, and they're hard, and you're like, man, I, I, I don't like these anymore. Now, today, you might say, well, I'm going to throw them away and get a new pair. And that's not what you did in the old days, man. If you had a good pair of leather gloves, them babies were going to last a long time because you weren't getting a new pair. What would you do with them? You take them in by the fire or on the register back in the old days when it blew hot air out of the register, and you would warm them up, and then you would take some oil, some lard, something, and you would, when they were warm, you would rub that oil on them, and then you would put them back into the heat and let it begin to soak in. And then you take those gloves and you begin to massage more oil into them. And you might do that two or three times. But when you were done, those gloves would become supple and soft, and you would put them on, and you'd be like, oh, yes. Why? It's like a fresh, new pair of gloves that's the picture jesus is painting here he said it's not that we got to put new wineskins listen there's so many in the church that have said well if god's going to move it's got to be in new stuff new church new people new 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 that's not what the text says god says here's the jesus says, here's the deal the new wine the new thing i'm doing has to go into a fresh wineskin now who's he talking about he's talking about you and i we have to be fresh Wineskins, if we're going to carry, if we're going to embrace the things that God's doing today in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our community, we have to be fresh, supple, able to move and expand with the things that God wants to do that maybe didn't fit what we used to know. And listen to me, that's true in your life and my life. It's true in all of our lives and our families. We've got to be fresh. We say, well, Brian, how do we become fresh vestals? How's that happen? Well, it happens this way. It is the fire of his presence. It is in the heat. And I'm not talking burning you. I'm talking warming you of his presence. Listen, we've got to get in his presence. He warms us. He begins to, you know, enable us to receive what he desires and then the oil of holy spirit is rubbed into our lives and our lives begin to be changed and molded why so that we can receive and carry the new thing that god wants to do in our lives the new thing he wants to do in our family because he says i don't want you to miss out on the fullness of what i have for you the old hymn, Spirit of the Living God says this, Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. I'm not sure we actually sing this believing it. Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Now, we've changed the words because we didn't like this next phrase. We've changed it to what? It changed it to melt me. But that's not the original text, words of the hymn. The original words were, break me. Now, it's not, hey, i got to break your life. 
What happens in that old pair of gloves? As you're rubbing oil and, and it, it, they get heat, what happens? Those fibers are broken so that you become supple. He says there's a process of Holy Spirit breaking those stiff places in us. And then he says, once I become supple, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Holy Spirit, reshape me. Enable me to become that which can carry what you desire to do. What you desire to do in my life. See, that's the process he's talking about. And I'm blown away when I look at Jesus looking over the city weeping because he looks and he says, you could not receive what I came to give you. And you missed it. You say, well, Brian, what's wrong with the old wine? I guarantee you, people will ask that every time you talk about this passage. Brian, old wine's still good. And the answer is absolutely. Look what Jesus says in verse 39. He says, and no one after drinking old wine wants new. For he says the old is fine. Come on, man. In the, in, okay, man, I got my favorite ice cream. Right? I don't know, Rocky Road. We'll pick Rocky Road. Man, I love Rocky Road. Man, it's so good. It's so awesome. And, and then all of a sudden, there comes along a brand new flavor that is far superior to that. Come on, Lynn, you're looking at me like, I love ice cream too, man. And it's like, no, I'm a Rocky Road guy. Rocky Road's my go-to. I, I don't think I want to go over there and get that new ice cream. Why? Because I'm content with what I have. Why? Because it's so good. God has been so good to us that that which he has done, the old wine, that the things he has already done, the things we've experienced are so sweet and so good. The temptation is to say, man, I just, I love this so much. I'm so good. I'm just going to eat Rocky Road till Jesus comes. And he says, yet, I have something far greater for you. Will you allow me to give you something even greater than what you've known? And the issue becomes what? It, there's some unknown. Come on, if you're a winemaker, you never know exactly how it's going to turn out. You stomp it, you do the work, you put it in the wineskin, and you're not sure what's going to happen. But here's what God says, what Jesus is saying. There's nothing wrong with the old wine. There's nothing wrong with fasting and praying in the context. What's he saying? The new thing I want to give you is even sweeter than the old. Will you trust me to take hold of the new, of the fresh thing I'm doing right now? Trust me that it's far better than what you've even had before. Amen? How many of us have been in that boat? Come on. It's been sweet. It's been good. If we don't allow Holy Spirit to make us fresh wineskins, we can miss what God wants to do. Verse 42, back in our original text now. For if you had known on this day even the condition for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, saying, you've missed. If you only knew what you missed out on. And I want to suggest, and, and this is not condemnation. It's true of my life. I'm sure it's true of my family as well. There have been times where Jesus has wept over the things he tried to give us and we would not receive because it didn't fit what we knew listen that's that's not condemnation that's just a sadness in the heart how many of you as parents or grandparents have tried to give something to your kids or grandkids and they choose not to embrace it and you're looking and saying man i wish so wish you would take hold of this because it would be so sweet it's so much greater and yet they cannot yet understand or see it 
and there's a grief in our hearts. Not that we are mad at him. Jesus, that's not talking about being mad. Jesus wasn't mad. He was grieved. And as we think about that, he was grieved over what they missed. And then verse 43, we finish this up. It says, for the days will come when your enemies will put a barricade around, against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and throw you down, throw down your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Jesus, having weep, in the midst of weeping, begins to prophesy over Jerusalem. Prophesying what will happen. Prophesying because of the peace they missed. In 66 AD, almost 40 years after Jesus uttered those words, the Jews would rebel against the Romans. The emperor Nero would send Vespusian and his army, and they started in Galilee and started working their way back, taking control of Israel once again. Three days before Passover in 70 AD, Titus, now who's general, comes to Jerusalem and he lays siege to the city. It's three days before the Passover, and so the Jews are crying out, we've got to get into Jerusalem for the Passover, and so he lets them in. But he doesn't let them out. The city is swelled within the wells with people, walls with people. And for seven months, Titus would besiege the city. No food, no water, no nothing would go in. Rebellion broke out inside. Infighting began to take place. People died. Cannibalism happened. In 70 AD, Titus breached the walls. He went in decimated, destroyed the temple. All that's left today is the Western Wall. Decimated that, completely destroyed the city, and the people who were left killed the vast majority of them and left the city completely gone. I wonder what we've missed out on. And sometimes we can beat ourselves up. I, I was thinking about this week as I was preparing this. I could pick some times in my life, I'm like, I missed it. The opportunity was right in front of my face, but because it didn't fit, I let it go. But here's the deal, I'm not going to lament those. I can't do anything about that. All today is, Lord Jesus, help me today as I move forward, those things that you have for me, for my family, the things that you're doing now for, in our, our church, in our community, in the big sea, help us to embrace those because, Lord, we do not want to miss anything that you desire for us because it wouldn't fit into what we thought or what we expected. Amen? And I think this morning is just simply saying, Lord Jesus, I want to be a vessel that can receive what you desire. And Holy Spirit, help me to take hold of this and not try and take what? That peg of what you've given me and stick it in the, in the same old hole. But Lord, show me what it is that you have that fits exactly what you desire for today. And friends, he'll do it. And we have to encourage one another. In our, as we journey together, because God is pouring out some new things. Please don't hear any condemnation, because we're all on the same journey, amen? And he simply wants to encourage you today. And so we're just going to pray, and then we're going to sing Spirit of the Living God, not that one, but another version. And I want you to just, you know, as Holy Spirit stirs you this morning, Lord, maybe there's a particular place where it's a little stiff, or maybe it's not able to receive. Or you know God's really stirring this thing and it's like, I've got this right here. And let him speak into that as he desires. Well, Father, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, today, we give you permission to make us fresh again. Fresh in our lives, fresh in our families, fresh in this, this body of believers. Lord, that we might be able to receive that which you desire to pour out. And oh, Lord, even though we not, may not know how sweet it's going to be, may we trust you 
that it will be better than anything we've ever tasted. We thank you, Father, and we praise you now in your mighty name.